If I had to give a title to this section of Genesis that we're moving into, I would call it the plot thickens. Because I promise you, this book is getting more and more intriguing and fascinating. We're going to come across some things that I suspect will raise our eyebrows because the Bible deals so directly and so uh, uh, intentionally with real life. I said, I said to you this, no, I said to some of you this morning that I hope that you don't look upon me as a history teacher. That is to say, merely sharing with you old what? Historical events. This book is contemporary as tomorrow's newspaper. So that we're not talking about, and the scriptures are not written to deal with ancient things because all other books are just words on paper. This book is alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder bone and marrow, soul and spirit. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And no one is hidden from its gaze. This is a mysterious and wonderful and living book. And I promise you what we're reading about in Genesis speaks to us in 2016. So here we are in the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. And, um, and where we left off last week is Joseph. Now Joseph, all of a sudden, is coming into focus. He is the 11th son of Jacob. And who is his mother? Rachel. Rachel only had two sons. And one was named, she named one Benoni, as she was what? Dying. And Benoni means what? Son of my sorrow. His father renamed him Benjamin, which means what? Son of my right hand. So he is the second to the last son. And what's the first thing the Bible tells us about Joseph? He's a what? He's a tattletale. He tells his father what his errant brothers are doing. And what's the next thing we find out about Joseph? Something before that. He was his father's favorite. And we asked last week, how did that make what? The others feel. So it's a negative to start with. Then his daddy exacerbated the situation by doing what? By giving him a coat, a, 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 a berry fancy, lovely coat that he did not give to the others. He did not buy 12 coats. He bought one coat. So imagine. Yeah, that's it. Imagine. So all the people are in the living room, in the den, and father walks in and says, hey, fellas, look, look, I, I bought your brother a coat. So when you understand the tension of scripture, it's the same kind of tension that that would cause in your house or in my house if we behaved in that way. Behavior has consequences. Joseph's tattletaling and the father's expressive love for him and the coat set the stage for what's going to happen next. Then what really poured uh, 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 grease on the fire. What else? So we have tattletale, father's love, special gift. What's the next thing? His dreams. And his dreams basically said what? We, I am going to do what? Rule over you. Now come on folks, enough is what? Enough is enough. They reached the tipping point. The frustration of family misbehavior, the frustration of a father's uh, in inappropriate fathering and now and now he has these dreams and he keeps doing what telling them about them I had that was that was that were 11 sheaves and one bowed down all the stars in the Sun bowed down so much so until even his father said what all right all right he says look he said look look you, you're my favorite but now you're getting on what that's what he said. I mean, you read it carefully, it's in there. 
He related verse 10 to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? Now, it's all right to dream, but son, you are tripping. You're, you're losing it. Verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. In other words, his father said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I think I need to set this boy straight, but something inside. It sort of reminds me of that word that said, and Mary pondered these things in her heart. It's like, you know what? I, I'm concerned about his attitude, but I think there may be something to this. Now, before we go on, I, I think it's very important that we stop and deal with this matter of dreams. And, I, and, and you, if you were here this morning, don't give it away. But when I ask you this question, why does the Lord give us dreams? Why? Because your dream has to do with your what? Your say it again. What did she say? Your destiny. That's the important thing. Folks, these dreams and the dreams that the Lord gives you are not wishes. They're not idle thoughts. They're not crazy ideas. They're not things you made up. The Lord puts dreams, and I do not necessarily now speak of a dream that you are asleep. When the Lord places something in your spirit, something in your heart, something in your mind, when something lives in you and breathes in you, God is putting something before you and the dream has to do with your destiny. It's where God wants to take you. It's what you're to become. And let me tell you something. I don't want to overburden this, but this is too important for us to let escape. You must understand, come to grips with, pay attention to, listen to me now, celebrate and appreciate and honor the dreams God has placed in you because those dreams determine your destiny. There is no such thing as a destiny without a dream. Why would I say that? Well, fine, try this. Go call American Airlines or Northwest or Delta and say, I want a ticket. And they're gonna say, okay, you get it. You call Uber, take me somewhere where you wanna go. And many people are living like that. They're just going somewhere. They're just wandering through life. But a dream gives you focus. A dream gives you purpose. And a dream gives you something to live for. It gives you purpose. It gives you hope. It gives you a desire. It gives you a reason to get up in the morning. And a dream also helps you to organize your skills and abilities. What is the difference between a river and a swamp? What's the difference? Good, all good answers. Here's the difference. The difference between a river and a swamp is a river has boundaries. A river has banks. Control. When you have no dream, when you have no vision, what happens to your energies? They're all over the place. You're here. You're there. You're doing this. But when you have borders, banks, all of a sudden now your energy is being properly directed and focused. And when the Lord gives you a dream, first of all, when there's a dream and the dream points to your destiny, now you know you're going somewhere. When you know that you're going somewhere, it changes your whole demeanor. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons that some people do almost anything they want to do is because they're not going anywhere. So it doesn't matter what they do. Those of us who try not to do certain things and not to engage in certain things, it is not because we think we're better or we don't want to do it, but because we're going somewhere, that dream determines what our behavior must be. And finally, a dream determines, a dream determines whether or not you can stand. The persecutions of life, the difficulties of life, the, 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 the 
uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune will wear you out unless you know you're going somewhere. Now the problem with dreams is that our lives are filled with dream killers. And you wonder why. Do I keep hammering this on you and I won't let it go? And I, I talk about it repeatedly because I understand if you do not get the people around you to feed your dreams, they will kill your dreams. You cannot afford to hang around with people that don't push you and promote you and urge you and demand better of you and call for more out of you. And most of you don't have those kind of friends. Most of your friends are on the same level as you are. And guess what? They can't take you higher. And you have people around you who actually speak against your dreams and you let them do it. They talk against your goals. You need some friends who are coaches in pushing you, urging you. And the thing you have to make a decided, definite decision to get the dream killers out of your life. Because that dream killer is not after your dream, they're after your destiny. And so, you need someone. The thing that probably bothers most of us about looking at the landscape of our current social and religious and political climate is that it's rather depressing. Where's the inspiration? Where's the, where's the high? and lofty and noble sense of things so that most people now are just living on the flat plane. That child back there that, that my youngest child was riding with me one day and coming from school and I was, I was listening to Dr. King and she said, Daddy, I envy you. I said, why? She said, because growing up you had him to listen to. I was listening to a man in Honduras who was, he was just talking and sometimes when people are really talking, they've got the floor, let them talk. I, and the Lord said, do not get in this conversation, let him talk. And he was talking about millennials. And he was talking about how millennials dress and how they think. And he kept saying, they don't want to be us. They don't want to be us. And that statement caught me. And I said, I know why. What have we given them to be? Amen. Our parents gave us something to reach for. What have we given this generation? When I look at these young people sitting here tonight, when I look at young people now who open their magazines and turn on their television to pick up books, what is there to be inspired about in 2016? We had Dr. King, and we had Malcolm X, and we had brilliant minds. I think about the preachers that I grew up under. When I was a child, and when I was a young preacher, when you heard a preacher preach that some of the preachers I heard, you know what we used to do as young preachers? We didn't go buy a suit. We didn't go try to imitate them. We heard preachers that made us want to go in a corner and sit up in a fetal position and say, Lord, did you call me? <laughs> they raised our sights. And now people look at us and say, well, I can do that. No big deal. So these young people don't have much to look up to. When is the last time somebody came out with a really good movie, a really good book, a really good song? What do these young people have to look up to? A flat, dull, boring, dreamless, destinyless age. And that's why I keep after you because, listen to me, no society can survive without an upward movement. And I'm not talking about financial mobility. I'm talking about something. A young man was talking to me the other night about the, who was it? Somebody about the letter from a Birmingham jail written by Dr. King. When he was in Birmingham, Alabama, leading that campaign, many of the religious leaders thought that he was, uh, it was too much, it was excessive, and they spoke against it, and they put an article in the paper. Dr. King wrote that letter, young people without Facebook, without a computer, without an iPhone, without, a, uh, uh, without an iPad. And guess what? He didn't have any paper, so they gave him the edges of newspaper and little pieces of paper of envelopes. And he wrote that, spe he wrote that letter, for every quote, every allusion, every, 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 every attribution was from memory. 
You get, you get the drift? And so the devil comes along and says, watch this. The devil comes along and says, I know how to kill life center. And I know how to kill the saints. Kill their dreams. Stop their destiny. This was this man's destiny. God promised to do something in his life. But let's take it a step further. Did I tell you where Joseph was in the lineup? Joseph was what? He was the next to the last. How many sons were there? Twelve. Joseph was what? Eleven. Watch this. Joseph was not in line to be the leader. You have to understand that God chooses. See, many of you, 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 you give up your dream because you do not think you fit the profile. But God says, I choose the profile. Now watch this. How many, how many, how many children did Leah have before she got to Reuben? I mean, before she got to Judah? Three. Three. Judah was the fourth son. But Jesus came through, not Reuben. You don't hear what I'm saying. Who was born first? Who was born first, Ishmael or Isaac? But who did God use? Who was born first, uh, Esau or Jacob? But who did God use? Don't you know that God says, I don't care about the birth order. I don't care about your gender. I don't care about your last name. I do not care about where you are in the order. If I chose you, and when God chooses you, you need to get over yourself and let him choose you and quit worrying about all the reasons he can't use you because God can do whatever he wants to do. Do you know you're chosen? Do you know he picked you out? So you're not the oldest. So you're not the prettiest. So you don't have all of this going for you. But when God chooses you, you ought to step into it, embrace it, enjoy it, receive it, and be blessed by it. Too many of us don't really enjoy being saved. We've lost the joy of being a Christian. We, we ask so many questions and so many issues. Look, I don't know why the Lord chose me, but he did praise his holy name. And it doesn't matter who doesn't choose you. If God chooses you, case closed, issue seven. Lay your hands on yourself and say, God chose me. I am chosen. Now look at the person next to you and say, now get over it. So what you don't like it? So much you have an attitude. That God showed this young man, you're the next to the last, but you're going to be a ruler. You're going to be someone special. His father's kept it. Now his brothers, verse 12, went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Now they had their nerve going back to Shechem. What happened in Shechem? They killed all those men to avenge their sister's rape. So they had their nerve going back, but they were, Israel, who is Israel class? Jacob said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. It's sort of reminded of the time when Jesse, sent David to see about his brothers in the war with Saul. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. I, I like verse 15 because my namesake and I share something unlike. We both are directionally challenged. I have serious problems with directions. So uh, both of us tend to wander around sometimes getting lost. He was lost. And a man said to him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they're pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have moved from here. But I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Now Dothan was about 15 miles from Shechem. So Joseph went down, went after his brothers and found them at Shechem. When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to do what? Put him to death. Now remember this. 
There are many types of Jesus in the Old Testament. Joseph is one. Joseph is a type of Christ, and we will draw some of those parallels as we go along. He was a type of Christ. They plotted against him to put him to death. Now, explain to me real quick, why did they want to put Joseph to death? Because, no, and? And? What were they really after? Hit the dream. And so that means they were not after the dream, they were after the what? And they were being used by Satan. I want you to remember this now. They were being used by Satan, but ended up being used by God. I'll show you that later. I won't give it away now. Many times you have to realize that behind Satan and all his stuff is another figure. You gotta remember that. Folks, God alone is in charge. I don't care what people say. I do not care what they do. I don't care what's in the paper. I don't care about all this stuff. God is always calling the shots. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. And there standeth God in the dim unknown, keeping watch o'er his own. And let me tell you something. Because God doesn't say anything doesn't mean he's not watching. And because he is silent does not mean his plan is not being worked out. That's why you ought to go to bed and go to sleep because he's carrying it. He's carrying out his plan. He doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber. He doesn't get tired. He fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and them that have no might, he increases strength. The youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Woo! The God I serve, the sun won't smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve your going out and you're coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without him. Notice, oh, ye of little faith. Don't you worry about circumstances. God is just standing there watching everybody play. And he laughs at them because they think they're doing something big. They think they're hurting you. They think they're stopping you, but the hand of God and the sovereignty of God and the purpose of God and the will of God and the way of God cannot be stopped. You can't vote him down. You can't shout him down. You can't veto him. No matter where you move on the chessboard, he said, checkmate. So, but here's the problem with the dream I didn't tell you. Sorry, I have to catch up. I told you that your dream is your destiny. Watch out for dreams, killers. Get the people around you that support and lift up your dream. But what I did not tell you, and I apologize, God does this. He gives you this dream, but he doesn't tell you how he's gonna bring it to pass. Uh, someone said that God is subtle but never devious. That's true. That's subtle. He will put this thing before you and it is so wonderful. It is so magnificent. It is so glorious and you get so excited and elated but he doesn't tell you the circuitous, torturous, arduous, painful, hard road you got to go to get there. Tell you what he does. He says, all right, I'm going to put you right there. That's your destiny. Oh, praise the Lord. Look at where he's going to put me. Now, one would think that what he's going to do is to take you from where you are and usher you right up and put you where he promised you. Well, I want you to know, good luck with that. Now, watch this. I'm going to tell you how to survive, too tell you how to survive. Never forget what he said. Never lose your eye on the prize. But don't forget the process to get there. And don't let the process of getting there make you think that the process has canceled the promise. 
That's why some of you are giving up hope is because you've been in this so long, you think the length of time that you've been waiting and the circumstances that you go through have canceled what God said. And I can see why. Because you say, all right, the Lord chose me. And you get up and you start walking towards your goal. He said, stop, no, go over here. Now, how far am I from that podium? And the question is, what am I doing over here if I'm supposed to be up there? And then, okay, then he'll move. And then sometimes the Lord will do it. I love this. He'll take you, and, and, and because you're moving, you think you're moving toward the goal, and you're moving away from the goal. See, and, and the further I get from that pulpit, the smaller it gets in my eyes. So now you're over here, but you're supposed to be over there. So the Lord starts moving you. You say, uh-oh, oh, praise the Lord. I'm moving again. Things are moving. 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 And then he'll put you somewhere and he'll say, wait. The goal is up there, yes, sir. and I'm over here yeah. waiting, and waiting, yeah. and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. It gets better, y'all. So then the Lord will give you some people, uh, some people around you, company, friends, homies, Dogs, bras, somebody to lean on. And then just about the time you think you got you some homies, you look up. And you by yourself. Because you can never learn to be until you learn to be by yourself. You will never ever come to the fullness of who you are until you look around and nobody's there, nothing is there, no help, no friends, no aids, no support, no undergirding, no resource, all by yourself. And you have to lean only on the Lord. It doesn't mean those brothers hated you. Stop thinking that the people that left you hated you. God might have put them out. God might have been involved. And why does God just take you to the place? Well, there's a reason for it. It's called preparation. It's called getting you ready. You know those people in the Olympics a few weeks ago? I looked at them and I said, oh yes. Those swimmers didn't start swimming until two weeks ago. Two weeks ago they started swimming. Those runners, they've only been running for about six months. Let me tell you something. Those children have been swimming since they were babies. And Elder Wiley pointed out something to me. She said, look at the physique of some of those athletes. She said, their commitment to that level of discipline has altered their physique. Let me tell you something. You'll never get to where you're supposed to be until something gets altered in your life. You've got to walk with God until something gets altered. I was up in uh, Baton Rouge with some of you people who were trying to help. So we went to a place, I think Alicia was in my group, and we were trying to help a man with a home whose parents had antiques. It looked like Fred Sanford's place. And he was so frustrated because he was trying to figure out how in the world he was going to deal with that. So we did it in about a couple of hours. You could see the change in his countenance. So I saw something in that house of which you young people know nothing about, but some of you may have an idea. It was an old ringer tight washing machine. But then I picked up something and I, I picked up this object and I, I asked the owners, I said, is this what I think it is? They said, yep. And I asked these young people, do you all know 
what this is? They said no, and I smiled. And I, I proceeded to educate them. Now let me say this delicately. It was a chamber pot. AKA a slop jar. Young people, before we had indoor plumbing, the bathroom was outside. But two o'clock in the morning, you were not going outside. So right next to your bed, and you emptied it out the next morning. I'm not, am I lying, folks? And you young people now, when you bake, you have the box with the instructions and the, the talking oven that says, hello, I'm done, take me out. And your, and your ovens are computerized. Can we go back to the old ovens with two knobs, one turned it on and turned it off and set the temperature. And when granny made cakes, wasn't a recipe on the counter. She made it from scratch. And to make sure that the cake was ripe, she baked a sample first. But when she put the cake in the oven, you better not run through the house. You make that cake fall almost. Am I right, y'all? And that cake would smell up the whole house. Oh, bless his name. But because it smelled good, Granny wasn't convinced. She go over and get the broom. Pull a straw out of the broom. Stick that straw in that cake. If it was dry, it was ready. If not, it went back in the oven. You, you know why you still in the oven? You ain't ready yet. You gotta bake some more. You need more joy. You need more anointing. You need more peace. You need more discipline. Perseverance. Tribulation work at perseverance. You ain't got it yet. You might fly off the handle. You might get lifted up in pride. God is not going to release you until you are right. You know why I told the Lord. I said, Lord, I have done everything you asked me to do. If you send me an ugly wife, I'm sending her back. I said, that's not fair. And I came to the conclusion that somebody got to marry the pretty girls. But I remember, I asked Elder Wiley, I said, will you love me when I'm old and unattractive? And she said, I do. There was a, uh, there was a, uh, a, 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 I was a single preacher for a long time. And I used to go around and preach from place to place. And I got introduced to more young ladies. And those mothers worked so hard. And this one mother in Saginaw, Michigan, I preached the revival at the church and she had a beautiful young daughter. She was, a, she was looking, I don't get me wrong. But she, she, she tried to win my heart by baking me a cake. And I took that cake home, and I bit into it. It was only three-fourths done. I never called her or her daughter ever again. <laughs> Don't experiment on me. Get your stuff together. So. So, Joseph and you and I must go through preparation. 
God never uses anyone greatly until he first wounds them deeply. The last time my dad spoke to my homiletics class at the School of Urban Missions, he gave some tips on preaching and then he looked at them and said, and I pray the Lord break your heart. And everyone here who's ever had a broken heart, stop crying. Stop whining. Stop. That's where the power comes from. Don't you know that when, when John looked into heaven and that angel flew through the heavens saying who is worthy to take the seal and open the book? He didn't say who was able. He said who is worthy. A lot of folks are able but they're not worthy. He said, I cried much. The angel said, quit crying, John. Look under the altar. A lamb as if he had been slain. As my father says in his poetic way, the blood marks in the hand are the seal of authority. Because he was slain and your hurts and your brokenness does not mean the vision is not going to come. All these delays and detours and hurts and upsets. No, 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 no. It's a part of the process. It's in the plan. You belong to God. Your hurts and trials are proof that he is blessing you. But we don't teach that. Through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom of God. We don't teach that. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. David said it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn the statutes of the Lord. The process the process. Um, <laughs> I send you home with a smile and I'm done. Um, one night, no, one early morning, knock came at the door about 3 a.m. And the husband got up and went to the door. An intoxicated man said, I, I hate to bother you, sir, but will you give me a push? He said, if you don't get away from my door, it's 3 a.m., it's pouring down rain, go away and leave me alone. He went back and laid down. His wife said, who was that? Some guy wanted me to give him a push. His wife said, I'm ashamed of you, just ashamed. Two months ago, you were broke down on the, on the highway and somebody came up and gave you a push. Have you forgotten that act of kindness? He said, you're right. Got up, put his coat on, put his raincoat on, put his boots on, went out and said, hello, hello, are you still there? He said, yeah, I'm here. He said, you still need a push? He said, please. He said, where are you? He said, on the swing. you said I sent you home with a joke let me read the scripture when they saw him from a distance before he came close to them they plotted against him to put him to death they were trying to kill the dream trying to kill the destiny they said to one another here comes the dreamer now then come and let us kill him watch this and throw him into one of the pits and we will say, a wild beast devoured him. That's a conspiracy. Then, and I close on this, then let us see what will become of his dreams. You get it? Yes, sir. You, you get it? Let's kill him because we despise the dream. And then let's see. And there are people who think if they stop you, if they kill you, but as long as the dream is in me, I can't die. You will not die until God's promises and purposes in your life have been fulfilled. Amen. Amen. Should I say it again? You will not die until God's promises and purposes in your life have been fulfilled. Come to the place where abundant lies abide. Come 
to a place where you will find 